Thank you so much for tuning this way for our worship time together here at Four Mile Baptist Church. The service we're about to join has been pre-recorded, but I trust it will be a great blessing to all of our hearts. I'm glad the Word of God is rich and powerful and is able to speak to us in every situation of life. So let's join now the worship service and let God have His will and His way in our lives. is upon us times are good or whether we be in bleak times going through that valley that storm that we might not understand he's telling us don't forget the law of God don't forget the commandments that God has, has laid out keep it in our heart keep our lives centered upon God look to him for our leadership and our guidance and that's what he's telling us and, and in verse 2 for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. So he's telling us, he's, he's saying that to, to, to center our life around God. God had even promised Solomon when he, when he made the promise to him that, that if he would follow his precepts, if he would keep his commandments, that he would have a long and prosperous life. Now if he went, went astray and went against it, he, that, that wouldn't be the case. But so, Solomon here, he's telling us, he's saying for long days, for ble to be blessed, and we know certainly there's, there's tragedy and there's calamity that we don't understand that comes upon us but that uh, under God's hand. But he's telling us that, that overall, to have long, prosperous days, to trust in God, to follow his concepts, to follow what he would have us to do. Now in verse 3, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. What's he saying? Don't get away from God's mercy and from the truth of God's word. You say, well, why, why is he telling us that? Well, just think about it. How easy is it to get with the wrong crowd, as we call it, to drift off? Well, everybody else is doing it. It must be okay. It's, it, and he's telling us to be careful about that. Don't get caught up in the ways of the world. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Don't, don't let it leave you. Stick with the truth. Stick with God's will. Stick with God's word. Stick with what God would have us to do. And how do, how do we do that? Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. He's, he's saying, just like if we had a necklace and we had the scripture, wearing it around our neck. But yet he's wanting us to go on a deeper level than that. To bind it within our very being. How do we do that? It's prayerfully studying God's word. Prayerfully listening to God's men speak and teach. And prayerfully seeking to do God's will. Listening to the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, guiding us. And that is the way that we bind His Word upon, our, upon the table of thine heart. Memorize the Scripture. Strive to do that that God would have us to do. And that, that's what He's telling us here. Don't, don't let truth and mercy forsake you. And how do you do that? By emerging yourself in God's Word and allowing it to be a part of us. To be a part of the fabric of your life. Is that, that should be our desire that we do that, that we, because we're always going to be tempted. There's always going to be things out there that, that's trying to pull us away. And Satan, when, when he knows that we're trying to have a close walk with God, he's going to do all he can to make us stumble and stutter and fall. He knows the enticements that draws us away. And in order to fend off those enticements, we have to bind his word, God's word, in our heart. We have to stand strong and steadfast in it. Now in verse 4 he's telling us, So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. So to bind God's word and, and his tender mercies in our heart and in our life, what does that do? That gives us good standing with our, with our Lord and Savior. That he says that, that that's the way to do it, to find good favor and good understanding in the sight of God and what? And man. What is our mission as Christians upon earth? Our mission is to win other Christians. Our mission is to be a witness, to be a living example. And how do we do that? By seeking this wisdom that Solomon is spelling out here. To, to have a wise, God-centered life. 
to shun away, to push away the things of the world that comes in and tries to corrupt us and lead, lead us away. And they, he's telling us if we'll do that, we'll find favor in God's eyes and we'll find favor in man's eyes. And, and, and we'll be that witness. We'll be that example that God has called us to be. In verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. What is that saying? Everything we have. Trust in God. Trust that he's going to lead us. Trust that he's going to guide us. And he's going to help us through those storms. And lean not unto thine own understanding. It's so easy to say, I've got this. We can look at examples in God's word even. Of God's people, God's leaders. That have tried to fix things on their own. And what happened? It just complicates it more and more when we think we've got this. I've got this, God. Well, when we say that, it just gets more complicated. The storm just gets deeper and rages stronger. So he, he's telling us, don't lean in our own understanding. Just put it in God's hands and trust in Him. Uh, obey Him and, and look to God to, to give us that direction, to give us that that understanding instead of trying to take it into our own hands and that that one maybe that that verse is maybe a little hard for some of us to take at some time to put all of our trust to put all of our faith in God knowing that he's always here that he's always going to lead us through what if I stumble and fall just like mama but brush the knee off kiss it put a little band-aid on it and everything's okay God's the same way if we stumble and stutter and fall he's there to pick us up to lift us up. So we need to trust in him. Have that faith. Knowing that, that whatever our circumstances is. Even if I've tried to fix it. Through my own way. God is still there to come in. And ultimately to really fix it. That's what he's telling us here. To trust in God. To, to have our wisdom in him. Now verse 6. And all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. What better direction in our life could we ask for than having God direct our every step, our every thought, our every action? And that's what he's telling us here. He's saying, and, and all of our ways to acknowledge him in order to have God direct us, in order to have God lead us and uplift us, what do we have to do? We have to acknowledge him, respect, trust, have faith, and follow God. And that's, that's what he's telling us here. If we'll, if we'll do that. He'll lead us through life's paths, wherever it might take us. Sometimes we get, seem like we get in circles and we don't understand where we're going. Don't understand it. We say, oh, well, I've just, uh, I just don't know what's going on in my life. But God does. And he wants us to trust in him, to have that faith. Remember Solomon here, he's been there and done that. He was blessed. He had it all. But sometimes having it all can be a curse within itself. Because he, he wanted to, he, he checked out the things of the world. He checked out the, what the world had to offer. But it was all empty. Vanity of vanities. It was vain. No, no, no fulfillment. It didn't, didn't prove anything. So we see Solomon here as he's writing this. Remember, he is qualified to write these words. Because ultimately, he turned to God realizing that it all was in God's hands. And that he had to trust upon God and depend, depend upon him. So as he's writing this, as I say, he's been there and done that. And he, even, even as he was writing to his people of his ages, he, you and I, it still applies. It still applies to us these many centuries later. Even with all the modern technology and all the knowledge that's out there, and now we've got the big thing that's going, the AI, artificial intelligence. And we, even as we're fighting that, we know that the true intelligence, true knowledge, true knowledge, true wisdom comes through God. He blesses us and allows us to have the technology to be used, to use it to help us, but we need to always trust in God and depend upon Him and seek His guidance. In verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Okay? Here's another one. This is a little bit hard for some of us to, to heed to it sometimes. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Well, I've got a doctor in it, doctorate in this. I've got a master in that, a minor in that. I've went to school all my life. Okay, that's great. God has blessed you with the opportunity to get a good education, 
to have the knowledge, but we need to be careful. Even if I've got, you say, well, I, I dropped out of school in the eighth grade. Okay, well, whatever your level of education is, we can still think we know it all. Think I know, I've, I've been there and done that. I know how, I know I've got this. Sometimes it pays. God might come through the form of an older brother or sister, Christian brother or sister that comes in and, and with a little common word of, devi- of advice to, to help us along the way. Things, things we don't understand. Once again, Solomon, as he's pinning this down, as I keep saying, he's been there and done that. He knows the ways of life. He knows the pitfalls that are out there. But he also knows the goodness of God's tender mercy when he depends upon him and calls upon him. So he's telling us here, don't, don't handle it yourself. Don't be so smart that we're smarter than God. Say, I wouldn't do that. Wait, wait, just a minute. Just think about op- th- times in your life, times in my life, when I thought I had it under control. I've got this, God. I, I can handle this. But then we look back and we see what a mess we have made out of it. So it's easy to say that I, I, don't, I don't have any problem with trying to be too wise. But if, when we really stand back and reflect on it, sometimes we, we try to handle things on our own and try to, try to discredit God. And he's telling us the answer to that is fear the Lord. Have a reverent respect of God. Trust in God that he's going to always be there. That he's always going to lift us up. And, and tender love and mercy and that, that's the way to do it and depart from evil to depart from evil that takes action the world's out there it's all laid out it's all offered as I said before everybody else is doing it so it must be alright but he's, he's telling us to depart from evil and that takes an act depart that, that's a verb that means you've got to take action you've got to get away from it so to, get, to depart from evil, we have to make a conscious decision that we're not going to get caught up in the ways of the world. We're not going to get caught up in that that's not good. We're not going to get caught up in that that might tarnish our testimony, our living testimony of daily life. People get more testimony out of watching what we do, what we say, and where we go than they do out of standing there quoting Bible scripture. And quoting Bible scripture certainly has its place. And that's it's, it's certainly good in giving a testimony. But people are watching our life. They say, that's a Christian. You know, what, why, why is his truck at the lake the last three Sundays instead of at church? Or why, why is he telling dirty jokes like everybody else? Or why is every other word that comes out of his or her mouth a curse word? It takes action to depart from evil. And departing from evil... When evil's not in our life, what does that leave more room for? Good. That which is right. That which is righteous in the eyes of God. When we depart from evil, it, leave, it leaves us room to be where God would have us to be. Now in verse 8, It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. He's looking at the physical body. As we know the navel, that's where the unborn baby take, takes in the mama's nourishment. And he's saying that the word of God and being in God's will is, is this nourishment that comes in. It's, it's the health. It's what supplies our body. You say, well, I'm, I'm sick. I've got a terrible disease. But God is the one that supplies this inner peace, this inner productivity that, that comes through God's eyes. And, and it's just like the, looking at the body and the health that it takes. The bones are the backbone, the structure that holds us up. And he's saying the word of God, it's, it's this way. To strive for the truth, the tender mercies, and, and the guidance of God is what sustains our health, our spiritual health, and being what God would have us to be. Now, verse 9. Now he's looking at, we were speaking of being blessed and, and, and having a time of prosperity and having things that God has given us. In verse 9, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. We know that we're always taught to tithe of that that God has blessed us with, to put it in God's storehouse, and that, that reaches out to reach into those and, and helping those that are in need round about us, sharing what God has given us. You know, you know what? When God blesses us and prospers us, there's a lot of money in the bank and times are good, where did that come from? It's God. Whose is that? It's God's. 
God wants us to share it. He wants us to, to give that the first fruits, the best. Just like when, when they were making the animal sacrifices, they were to give the, the best. They weren't, you say, well, it's, it's easy. I'll just give this, this old bull that's about to die anyway, or this, this young calf that was born that's, that's crippled. No, God wants the best. And when he blesses us and prospers us, he wants off the top. He wants the best of what we have. In order to be continue to be blessed, as we're going to see, that's, that's where it comes from. It's honoring God with what he's honored us with. In verse 10, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So he's saying there's, there's promise in honoring God with the first fruits. When God pro- prospers us and blesses us, that's where the prosperity comes from, is in remembering where it comes from. Have we thanked God for that meal that we had? Most here today has probably had a full Sunday meal or yet to have it, and, and God has blessed and prospered. Most of us drove in in an air-conditioned car, comfortable, sitting in a nice air-conditioned church. Have we thanked God for blessing us, for prospering us? It's got through God's hand. Even our forefathers in the little white church, they, they had to raise the windows to let and run the fans when they had the opportunity of having fans to, to make it comfortable enough to, to sit and hear God's word. But God has blessed us. God has prospered us. Have we thanked him for it? Have we returned part of what he's given us to him and, and shared it with others that are in need? Verse, verse 11. Now he's looking at, a, at another thought. So what, what if we go astray? What if we do that which God doesn't want us to do? My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Okay, what if we do wrong? Sometimes God has to correct us. Sometimes God has to set us on the right path. Sometimes maybe a sickness or a tragedy or something that take place, that might be God's correcting Rod coming upon us, showing us that, that we've went astray and that we've went wrong. And he's saying, don't despise that. Don't, don't get angry at God for correcting us. If he doesn't correct us, what happens? We just keep plunging off in the wrong direction, getting further and further away from him. So we can praise God for that switch of correction that, that, that he brings upon us, that, that he, so that he turns us around. Neither be weary of his correction. What if we do it just over and over again? Don't, don't get weary of God reaching out. It's through love that he reaches down to, to instruct us, to guide us, to show us the wrong that we have done, to bring us back on the path, back into his tender mercies. And that's, that's what he's telling us. He, he's, he's reaching out once again. He says, my son. He's saying this. Solomon hears. He's reaching out to those that are hearing and those that are reading. He's saying it out of tenderness, out of love through experience, life experience in his own personal life. He's, he's reminding, when God has to punish you, that's good. He's doing it out of love. Now, verse 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. So he's telling us, once we're a child of God, once God loves us, out of this love, he's going to set us straight, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. He's looking in the home. And we know that many today in today's society, there's many broken homes and there's a lack of discipline. And that's part of what's, what's happening with the fabric of our nation, the morals of our nation. It's all going, going awry and going against God's will. But he's, he's looking at the example of the father here. The father that loves the son. He wants the son to emulate his actions. He wants the son to, to, to be like himself. He loves that son with all of his heart. Well, what does he do? The son goes out and breaks a window and just, just out of the meanness of his heart. Well, what does the father do? He's going to make him pay for it. Probably literally work it off and literally pay for the window plus the punishment that might come. Why? Because he loves the son. If he doesn't, do, if he doesn't take some kind of action, first thing you know, every window in the neighborhood is going to be broken because he let, let the son continue doing it. The son's going to be a reprobate. The son's going to end up in jail, end up in prison ultimately because of the minor offenses. And th- then he's going to get into more and more. And as I say, as he breaks more win- windows in the neighborhood. So what does the father do? 
He reaches out in love. He disciplines that son. He shows him, this is wrong. We can't do that. He makes him pay the price for what he has done wrong. He instructs him in how to do right. And he, maybe he, he gives him something constructive to do instead of breaking windows. And he's, he's saying that that is the example of the Heavenly Father that reaches down to instruct us, to discipline us. When we go awry, when we go against God's will, when we do that, that I think feels good, that goes against what God wants, God's going to reach down. He's going to punish me. He's going to show us what's right and what's wrong. But he does it. You say, that's a, that's a mean God. That's a main God of judgment. No, that's a loving God. He's trying to set us back on the path, put us back in the fold and surround us with his love. And he was using that example to, to show that, that truly that is the love of God. He goes on in verse 13, looking at happiness. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Okay, how many times do we hear maybe a young person or we call it maybe a midlife crisis? I'm going to go find myself searching for happiness, searching for fulfillment. Are we looking in the right place? Are we searching God's word? Are we prayerfully asking God? Maybe if it's maybe if we don't if we're trying to find ourselves, have we prayed God, show me what you would have me to do? Show, show me which direction you would have me to go in life. What, what is your plan for my life? Okay, we've reached a midlife crisis. You know, the men have to go out and buy a new Mustang or a new Camaro or whatever, you know, to, to be a kid again. Okay, God, show, give me a new purpose. Help, help me to see what you would have me to do at this stage in my life. Show me how I can be a light. Show me how I can be... Give instruction to those that are coming behind me. Help me, Lord, to see that that you would have me to be. And that's where happiness comes from, is seeking God's direction, to seeking God's fulfillment in and through our life. God has a purpose for us. And as I've said in other lessons, maybe the storms we go through, the tragedies, the trials that we go through, we don't understand. But sometimes that's guiding us for the purpose that God has in our life. It's strengthening our witness. Strengthening our testimony. Showing us maybe a new ministry. Or a new direction. That he would have our life to go in. And that's where our happiness. And our fulfillment comes from. You, you might have ha ha happiness. That was fun. Went to Six Flags last week. That was fun. But is that true life fulfilling joy. That wells up from inside. Happiness. And that's what Solomon is talking about here. Is this. This happiness that comes through the wisdom of seeking God's leadership and seeking God's fulfillment and direction in our life that we might do what that that God would have us to do. And he goes on to say, happy is the man that, that not only finds his wisdom, the man that getteth understanding. Understanding through God. Understanding what our purpose is. Might not understand why we're in this circumstance but understanding that it's part of God's will. And, and, and so doing that and saying, God, here I am. Maybe I don't understand, but help me to understand what you're, ha what you're doing here, how you're going to use me, how you're going to bring me through this, and what you would have me to be when I get through this. Because we all have a purpose. My purpose is different than your purpose, your purpose, your purpose. If we were all doing the same thing, what good would that be? There would be some tasks that wouldn't get done. Task in life or witness that, or, or missions that wouldn't get accomplished. So we all have different purposes. Our life experience leads us into being able to fulfill these different purposes that God has for us. And in order to have this happiness, this fulfillment, we have to seek God's wisdom, seek understanding through his word, through his will, and seek to do that that he would have us to be. Now continuing in verse 14. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. How many in here don't want to have plenty of gold, plenty of silver, plenty of riches? That, that's life's, part of life's ambition is to be comfortable, to be rich, to have the gold and the silver. But what's he showing us here? He's saying, think about it. 
the wisdom and understanding of God is far richer than the riches. Remember, this is Solomon pinning this down. The, the richest man in his day and time, and, and even, even today, comparatively, the richest man that, that had his kingdom built up and had, had all the riches and the, the things that man might desire in the flesh. He had it all. He was an example. The, uh, the other kingdoms and other kings would, would stand back and admire what he had and, and, and relish having the kingdom and having the riches that he had. So he's not just speaking emptily here. He's speaking through life experience, through the directing of the Holy Spirit and pinning this down. He, 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 he says that the wisdom and God's understanding far outweighs the riches of the world. It's good when God blesses us, when we live a comfortable life and, and share what he's, what he's blessed us with and, and thank him and praise him for it. But he's saying that this is, this is the wisdom is far outweighs the earthly treasures. She is more precious than rubies. And all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Looking at wisdom. The wisdom of God. Once again, the jewels, the riches, the treasures. That's, it's, that's the desire of man's heart. And which, which woman doesn't want beautiful jewelry to, 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 make her, to enjoy and to make her more beautiful? But he's saying here that this wisdom far outweighs these riches. The riches of the world and the things that, that other men might envy. This wisdom. It has a far greater value. Where do we place our value? What do we have in the bank? Do we have God's wisdom and understanding? Are we seeking after that and cultivating that? Or are we seeking further and further, more and more, putting more money, more riches in the bank and, and having more things? And that, that's what we need to be careful about and to realize. In verse 16, he's continuing on with his thoughts here. Length of days is in her right hand. And in her left hand, riches and honor. So he's, he's saying here, to have this wisdom of God is to, is to have the, the, the long days, of the fulfilling days, however, however how long life might be, to have the will, to be in the will of God, to be seeking to walk in his will, to do what he would have us to do in the understanding through the Holy Spirit. That's, that's to have long, fulfilling days, to, to be pleasantly, fulfilled not not empty not seeking not see not uh, fulfilling its vanity as, as Solomon has spoken of now in verse 17 her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace once again he's speaking of wisdom having the wisdom of God having this fulfillment this purpose through God through his will through his direction seeking his guidance and his and th wisdom through him, he's saying that this is the way for, for eternal, internal, and, and eternal peace and understanding and fulfillment. He's saying the, the paths are peaceful. And we, we go through, we know the world's in turmoil today. And it's easy just to get stressed out and to get worried about things that are taking place in the world and in our personal lives. But he's saying to have the wisdom of God, the understanding of God, directing our lives, fulfilling our lives, it overcomes the things of the world, the turmoil. We have that peace and that, that assurity. And verse 18, She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. So once again, he's still speaking of the accolades of the wisdom of God. This is the tree of life. This is the very sustenance of life. It's being wise in the ways of God. Seeking his guidance, seeking his direction, seeking to do that that he would have us to do. And he says, happy is everyone that retaineth her. Once again, he, he spent over these past three or four verses, he's looked at, looked at the happiness of wisdom. We might live in just a one-room shack somewhere and have a broken-down Volkswagen that we're driving. But if we've got the wisdom of God, it's a blessing. It's something to thank God for. I do have a roof over my head. I do have a, a car. And we thank God for that. But, the, the, but to have the wisdom of God, that person can be happier, more, fu more fulfilled, the one that has the mansion on the hill, the fleet of cars, the, the vacation home in Florida and in the mountains and in the Bahamas somewhere. 
that person that's living in that one room shack through the wisdom and understanding of God can be happier and more fulfilled than the one that, that has it all. And that's something that as we're striving, as we're in the rat race of life, as we're working too many hours, too many shifts, is it worth it? Is that really what God would have us to pursue? And certainly we have to fulfill our duties and, 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 and meet our finances and fulfill our duties to our family and our, and our work, but we need to slow down just a minute and ask, is this truly the wisdom of God, the direction that God would have us to go in? In verse 19, he's looking at the wisdom, the wisdom of God that, that laid the very foundation of the world. And we know God's wisdom is what, what spoke it all into being. God's wisdom is what made salvation possible for all of mankind. It was always in the, since the foundation of earth that his son, Jesus Christ, would come. That he would give his life. That sinful man would have a, a, an opportunity to trust in Christ and his blood that was shed and come to him and through in salvation. So the wisdom of God is, is what laid all that out. Verse 19, the Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. So it was God's wisdom. Okay, everybody wants to, so some of the scientists want to say there's the Big Bang Theory. Just think about it. Just look at the intricacies of nature. Just look at each species. Just look at the beauty. Just go outside and at night and out, out of the streetlights and just look up at the stars and just feel the enormity, the presence of God. It took wisdom, infinite wisdom. It took understanding for God to be able to create that. It, it all works together. Just look at the way that humans and, and other species reproduce. It took the wisdom of God that this might be able to fulfill in this way, the way the beautiful actions that, 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 it, that it undertakes and, and the results. Just, just look at the wisdom that it took for all of that to fall in place, that it might all work out according to what God would, say, would do. And then Solomon here is telling us that this, God made man in his image, he gave us the opportunity to choose to worship God, to praise God, or to rebel and turn against God. And then and he gives it, and being in his image, we have this opportunity to make decisions, to make choices, and to make the choice to seek God's wisdom, his direction, his guidance in our life. That's what Solomon is saying. That's what we should desire to do. The very God that laid the foundation of the world, the very God that created the wonder of all that's in the world, we can, we can share in that wisdom if we'll just trust in Him and call upon Him and help ask Him to give us just a portion of that wisdom as we go about our daily life and that we might be what He would have us to be. In verse 20, By His knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. Just think, the, the very rain that comes, that's God's will, that's God's ability. And before Noah and the flood, God provided the water through the dew that just came down and watered the land. But God provides. Yesterday the, and Friday, the storms came out of nowhere. We were hurting for rain. We were beginning to hurt for rain. God provided. He gave us the rain that we needed. There was a little wind with it, but God knows. God's understanding, God's wisdom. He supplies our needs. We're in a period of drought, you might say. Well, God, God knows what he's doing. Maybe, maybe he's going to fulfill a purpose through that. But it's all in God's wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding that he created it all. And Solomon is telling us here just to lean upon, to trust in God, to understand that it's God's wisdom and his understanding that created it all. If we'll just call upon him, he'll share that wisdom with us. Not that we'll ever be wise as God, but he'll give us the wisdom to function and what it is he's called us to do and to have the happiness and the fulfillment that he's called us to have. Now, verse 21, My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Once again, lovingly, he's saying, My son, those that are coming after me, those that are hearing this, those that are reading this, don't let it depart from you. He's telling us earlier, we read the verse where it tells us to let evil depart. Push it away. Don't have any part with it. He's telling us, don't 
push away the wisdom of God. It's easy, once again, to get caught up in the ways of the world. Look at what I'm doing. I'm tired. I'm busy. Push God out of the picture. And he's telling us, don't do that. Stick with the wisdom of God. God, I'm tired. I'm busy. I need your help. I need strength. I need you to lead me. I need you to help me make the right decisions in handling this stress that I'm under. I need your help, your guidance. And instead of pushing God away, I'm too busy. I'm too busy to pray. I'm too busy to go to church. I'm too busy to study God's Word. That's, what's that doing? That's causing the wisdom to depart. That's pushing it away. I can handle this myself. That's, that's not the right answer. That's t- pushing it away. And that's what he's telling us. My son, don't let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. It takes this wisdom. It takes this discretion. We have many decisions daily. We have little decisions that might affect the outcome of the rest of our lives. And certainly there's those once in a lifetime opportunities or decisions that we might have to make as we call it. Whatever. Whether it just be the little decision that we need to use the discretion that God has given us. That the Holy Spirit has given us. When we come to that forks in the road that we know which fork God would have us to take. Is it the godly fork? Or is it the fork that feels good, looks good, and that will prosper me? We need to pray. We need to ask God, what is the right fork? What is the right discretion? What is the right direction that you would have me to go in? And that's, that's what he's telling us. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck to make the right, right decisions, to have the discretion, to go in the right direction. He's saying that's, that's supporting our very life. That's uplifting us and, and guiding us in that way. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. What happens as we go through life? We stumble and stutter and fall. But he's, he's saying if, if we'll seek the wisdom of God, seek his understanding, seek the purpose that he has for us, that we might be fulfilled, that we might be happy, not, not just ha-ha happy, but that we might really be fulfilled, have a purpose, happy in our life. He's saying do this and that, that allow God to lead us. Allow God to walk us through safely. Safely through the valley. Safely through the storm that we might not understand. But if we'll trust in God, He'll lead us through it. If we'll just trust and lean upon His wisdom and seek His guidance, and He'll keep us from stumbling and falling and faltering. And in verse 24, When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down. And thy sleep shall be sweet. How many times do we come in from a busy day? Everything in our mind. Oh, what should I have done about that situation? Who, I need to call so and so tomorrow. I need to do this. He's just saying, trust in God. I'm talking to me now. Trust in God. And you'll have that peace, sweet, calming peace. But it takes the wisdom, the understanding... And the discretion to turn it over to God. Sure, the problems when you wake up tomorrow, those situations will still be there. But how are we going to handle it? If we stressed out about it all night, laid there tossed and turned, worried about it, wondered about it, how are we going to handle it when, we're, when we come to work in a frazzle? He's telling us, trust in Him. Seek His wisdom. Seek His understanding that you might have that peaceful sleep. And I think maybe we carry that beyond just a night's sleep that we might have. Speaking of that fulfilling happiness and fulfillment and purpose, if we'll trust in Him and, and not, not get caught up in the ways of the world, if we'll just trust in Him, He's telling us that, that, that we'll have that sweetness, that fulfilling. Verse 25. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. What? We're talking about happiness, peace, sweetness, everything going good, fulfillment. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked, when it cometh. He didn't say if it cometh. When. Solomon, he'd been through it all. He'd seen it all. He had it all. And he's... He's speaking through experience here. 
He says, when you get away from the will of God or when, when God allows these tests, these challenges, these storms to come into your life, he's, he's saying, don't be afraid. And he goes on to say, sudden fear. Things are going good. Drifting along. Everybody's healthy. Everybody's happy. Plenty of money in the bank. Got, got plans. Everything's good. Suddenly, calamity comes out of nowhere. What do we do? What do we do? Sudden. Changes life as we knew it. It happens. If I, if I look around the room, I dare say that every one of us have had that come into our life. Sudden fear. Sudden calamity. Sudden things that we don't understand. Sudden things that completely changes our course of action, our course of life. And Solomon's saying here, don't be afraid of this. Don't be afraid of the desolation of the wicked when those come against us and people may actually even have people plotting against us and even today as, as things there's going to be more persecution as, as we're, our nation and times are getting more and more anti-Christian he's telling us to stand firm to trust in God to seek his wisdom his guidance and his, his direction to be safe in his arm but he, go, he, he concludes that thought by saying the be not afraid of sudden fear, neither the desolation of the wicked. And as I said, not if it comes, when it comes. So that's instruction for all of us as we're sitting here tonight to when it comes because it is going to come. It might be major. It might be a life-altering thing or it might just be something that makes us uncomfortable or something different than what I thought I had anticipated or what I wanted to do. It's going to come. And Solomon is saying here, don't be afraid. How do we not be afraid? Trust in God. God, this storm has gotten bigger than me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how to handle this. My family's dependent upon me. My coworkers are dependent upon me. This is bigger than I am. I'm, I'm afraid. God, give me the wisdom. God, give me the understanding. God, give me the strength, the peace, the direction that I might know how to maneuver this storm. That I might be able to go through it and come out stronger. And that I might, even if my course has changed, that I might go the direction at the speed you would have me to as I go through this. So that's, that's the way to handle it when it does come. Now I'm going to conclude here in verse 26 this evening. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. What's, he, he said, verse 25, when it cometh. It's coming. The storms of life are out there. Some of us may be in a storm. Some of us, as we've said, may, may have just come through, been through a storm. We can be assured all of us are facing storms in the future. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next year. It may not be a major life-changing storm, but the storms are out there. The things we don't understand. But and he, he, he said, he started verse 5 by saying, Be not afraid. Don't fear these things. Why? Verse 26. For the Lord shall be thy confidence. Confident that the Lord is going to lead me through. He's going to buoy me through the weight, raging waters, the storms, the winds, the thunder, the lightning. The things I don't understand. He's there. But how do we get the... The peace from that? By trusting in the wisdom of God. By seeking His wisdom. Lord, how would you have me to maneuver this storm? I, it's, it's bigger than I am. I can't handle this, God. I need your peace. I need your understanding. I need your direction in my life and leading me through. He says, For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. If we're not careful, we'll just fall, stumble, the foot will slip right out from under us and we'll fall flat on our face. We can be, we can go through the storm, we can come out bitter, holding grudges, cursing God. Our foot's done slipped out from under us. Everything we knew has done changed paths. Solomon's saying, that's not the path of wisdom. That's not the understanding. That's not the peace that God keeps us in. So how are we going to handle these sudden fears that he spoke of? These things that we don't understand. These things we weren't expecting. Are we going to call upon God? 
seek his wisdom, his understanding, that we might have that fulfilling peace and purpose in our life, or are we going to stumble and fall? should be our desire that we allow him to pick our foot up, to keep it from being, falling out from under us, that we don't stumble and fall. And that should be our desire. I know this, this evening that's, that's been kind of quick, but and I really didn't say that much, but I hope that what Solomon said, that's my desire, that what Solomon said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that it might inspire each one of us daily to seek the wisdom of God, to seek the understanding of God, to thank God, praise God for what he has done for us and to th thank him for the times he has led us through the storm and pray that whatever course our life might go, that we personally might be that witness, that living example that God has called us to be that might point others to Christ. That should be our desire. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, God, to open your word up, Lord, to look into it. I pray, God, that each one of us, God, would just take a moment and ponder, God. Are we seeking your wisdom in life, God? Or do we take the, I've got this stance, Lord, and thinking that we can handle it ourselves, God. Help each one of us, God, to ponder this, God, and to truly seek your wisdom, to seek your guidance, God, that we might enjoy that peace, that happiness, that assurance, that fulfillment that you're allowed to give us, God, even through as we, as we studied Solomon's word tonight, Lord. We thank you, God, and praise your name, God, for all of your blessings, for all that you've done for us, God, and pray that you'll bless us throughout this upcoming week, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Thank you, Brother Ken. What a great, great message. What a great timely message for our times and when we're living. Uh, the days we're living in. Boy, I like that. Uh, what a great, great uh, exposition of Proverbs chapter 3 and how we can learn from it and be reminded of God's provision, His wisdom for our lives when we trust Him. I, I don't know what your heart may hold tonight. Maybe you need to come. James said, if any man like wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And he, he, hey, he'll give it to you if you ask him. Maybe you need to come pray tonight. Maybe there's someone you need to come pray for. Something you need to pray about in your life. As Brother Ken opened tonight, he began to talk about those things and how to trust God. And maybe you need to come pray about trusting him more. Whatever you need may be. She's going to play through a verse. And during this verse, if God's speaking to your heart, you need to come. You come.